introduce our panelists. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Carol Burnett. I'm the director of the Low Income Child Care Initiative, and we're delighted to have you join us today for this webinar. Um, I know many of you are very interested to learn about the small grant program available um, to child care centers. And we have two folks who are going to help us understand more about that today. Um, and I'm going to introduce them both. Um, the first person you're going to hear from is Kiat Burt. He is a policy analyst at Hope Policy Institute. In this position, he demonstrates the impact of social policy across the Deep South. He's responsible for producing blog posts, policy briefs, providing credible analysis on HOPE's programmatic issues, and raising awareness on the challenges and successes in the Deep South. His primary areas of research include community and economic development, affordable housing, food insecurity, financial inclusion, and student loan debt. During his time at HOPE, Kiad has met with numerous community stakeholders and national organizations, such as the Mississippi Black Legislative Caucus and NeighborWorks America to amplify solutions needed in the Deep South. His work serves to further HOPE's goal of fostering opportunities that enhance the ability of vulnerable people and places to fully participate in the American economy. After we hear from Kiad, we're going to hear from Janet Dixon, Dickens. Janet is an assistant director with the Mississippi Small Business Development Center. She is currently working to develop communications and programming for the COVID-19 response. She's an adjunct instructor with the University of Mississippi School of Business for Business Communications. She is a graduate of the University of Southern Mississippi School of Business and the University of Mississippi School of Law, and she furthered her education with a Master of Laws in Taxation from the University of Florida Levin School College of Law. And I'm very excited to share that she and her husband are expecting a baby girl in July. So congratulations to you, Janet, on that. Um, so I am gonna turn it over. We're, our uh, speakers are gonna share information with you. And uh, for those of you who've joined webinars before, you know that if you would type your question into the Q&A, we're gonna get to as many questions as we can uh, after the presentations are completed. So Kiata, I'm gonna turn it over to you first. All right, thank you so much, Carol. So. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kia Birch, and I'm a policy analyst at Hope Policy Institute. Now, Hope is a unique community development financial institution in that we are comprised of three entities, Hope Enterprise Corporation, Hope Credit Union, and Hope Policy Institute. Now, since 1994, we have worked to increase financial inclusion among vulnerable populations throughout the Deep South, the Deep South being our five member states of Alabama, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Tennessee. Within those states, we've served approximately 50,000 members, the majority of which are people of color in distressed communities. Now, our aim in these communities is to increase affordable financial products, access to financial resources, and to bring about the end of structural challenges to financial well-being, such as persistent poverty and predatory lending. Now, we've been instrumental in providing access to small businesses of color via the Payment Protection Program, which I will talk more about maybe toward the end of the discussion, and have been impactful and increasing access to capital prior to the pandemic. Of note is that four out of four of our 10 small business loans uh, that we made have been in women-owned businesses. So we understand that businesses of color have historically faced challenges in, in accessing capital and resources, yet they play a pivotal role in local economies. So given that given the pandemic, supporting small businesses is vital to a healthy econ economic recovery, which is what we're here to discuss today. So the Mississippi Small Business Relief Program, what is it, who's eligible, what money is there, and how do you get it? So Mississippi uh, has allocated $300 million from monies received from the CARES Act to assist small businesses. The money is split into two buckets, $240 million for grants and $60 million for direct payments. Grants range from $1,500 to $25,000 and are based on two months of expenses while the direct payments are $2,000 that will be mailed to eligible businesses to cover general COVID-19 related issues. Now the program is a great opportunity to get help because it prioritizes businesses most in need. 
For example, for the first 21 days, oh, this is for the grant portion, for the first 21 days, the Mississippi Department of Authority will only consider applications from businesses that did not receive federal assistance, such as the Payment Protection Program or an Economic Injury Disaster Loan. Also, the uh, Mississippi Department of Authority has, has a set aside, a $40 million set aside for the first 60 days for minority and women-owned businesses. Okay, this set aside will ensure that they have a fair chance of, re of receiving aid. And furthermore, the program is unique or rather novel in that it provides direct payments and grants for small businesses, not loans. Given the uncertainty of the economy, this avoids increasing the debt burden for small businesses. So I know a lot of y'all may be thinking, look, how do you apply? Well, you do not have to uh, apply for direct payments. MDA will disperse payments to eligible businesses via mail. Uh, eligible businesses include businesses that shut down forcibly or voluntarily due to federal, state, or local COVID-19 orders and are in the retail, trade, information, food, arts, and entertainment industries. Uh, to, see if you, um, to see if you qualify, you can visit... Um, I have to pull the link up and I can tell you exactly what to visit. Just give me a few moments and um, we could do that. Um, so I'll, I'll double back to that. But to apply for a grant and to verify eligibility, you should visit the backtobusinessmississippi.org website. And it's a fairly straightforward application process. You can save your progress at various points throughout the, uh, the application. And, um, and eligible businesses include for-profit organizations, LLCs, and sole, sole proprietors. Businesses have to have been in operation as of March 1st, 2020, and eligible expenses include utilities, costs incurred for adhering to public health measures, and payroll. Your grant amount will be calculated by either the amount of eligible expenses incurred in a two-month period or by the number of employees as of March 1st, 2020, in addition to a base grant of $1,500. Now, the two-month period is going to be calculated from the date in which the business reports have experienced harm due to the pandemic and to the point in which you, uh, so it'd be two months out from that date, okay? So just really quickly, overall, there are gonna be three options for grant funds for, that, for the grant portion of the money. There's gonna be a base payment of $1,500. That's the first one. The second one, there's gonna be a base payment of $1,500 plus $500 per full-time equivalent employee as of March 1st. That will not exceed $25,000. And there's gonna be a base payment. There's an option for base payment of $1,500 plus the payment to cover itemized eligible expenses, which you will list on the application, which again will not exceed $25,000. So if you have received federal assistance, you still, you still can apply. The grant, the grant award, however, will be reduced by the amount of uh, federal assistance you did receive, but it will not be reduced by more than half. Okay, so I'm gonna stop right there uh, before we get into any more of the weeds and I will shift it off to my other co-panelists to kind of talk about eligibility and, and other things. So thank you so much. Thank you, Kiad. I appreciate that so much. And um, if you can provide that link, we'll put it uh, in the chat so that everyone can have uh, access to that. And um, we'll uh, save questions for you uh, until after Janet's presentation. So Janet, I'll turn it over to you Thanks. now. Thank you, Kiyad. That was a great introduction to the program, and mm -hmm. um, I will try to not replicate too much of it um, <laughs> as we go through. Um, so I, I have a slideshow that I'm about to share screen on. And so we'll give it just one second. Just wanted to confirm that we're able to see um, a Back to Business Mississippi grant program. Yep, that's okay. that great. Fabulous. Okay. All right. Well, um, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm actually kind of new to this position. It's only been kind of in play for about three months. And so I've gotten to do a lot of COVID-19 recovery, and it has been hard and busy, but also rewarding to see businesses getting the help they need. So I work with the Small Business Development Center. And for those of you who don't know what we do, we're a federally and state funded program. And it is our job to provide services to small businesses at a no cost, um, no fees whatsoever. So we, we provide, and I've got a good little list to go in here, you know, helping technical support and creating budgets, 
Um, if you need help in creating a business plan or securing loans or starting your business and understanding the process or that, or if you already have a business, how do you strengthen that and grow it? Um, so that's what we're normally doing. And since uh, COVID-19 struck, we have spent a lot of time, basically, I like to call it triaging businesses, um, trying to help businesses figure out how to adjust and recover during this period and hopefully come out stronger. So I've been tasked with the communication portion of this. And so Back to Business Grant is one of those programs that fall right in my, my wheelhouse. It is you know, potential help for small businesses that, that we're trying to work with. And so I always, before I get started, because I am an attorney, I have to give a little uh, ethical disclaimer. <laughs> and so I will get that really quickly out of the way. That first, my presentation is not meant to be legal advice and it is not meant to create an attorney-client relationship. Um, so if you do need actual legal advice specific to your situation or um, accounting, financial, those sort of things, I would suggest you ask outside counsel for that kind of help. But we'll get started now that I got that little bit out of the way. So some of the goals, I just want to make sure we all understand what services Small Business Development Center can do for you as a small business. And also just eligibility requirements of this grant. We're going to go through what the actual application process looks like and hopefully get everybody like a really good baseline to know how to apply for this. So I wanted to clarify because we've got lots of different organizations and lots of different acronyms going on. So our job at the Small Business Development Center is to help people in the application process. That is what we're doing on the grant. The Mississippi Development um, Authority is actually the one that is over the grant itself. So they're the ones that are over the website and applying. They're the ones that are making decisions on how those grants are processed. Um, any kind of technical questions are, are going to go to them, but we're here to help in the nitty gritty of trying to get the application done. And we've actually established a hotline for this and it's manned by um, a couple a client outreach specialists is what they're called and their job is to determine eligibility, try to walk through that with any clients that call in and then they can help hook you up with a counselor. And even if there is some sort of eligibility problem, we still would love to talk to you as a business because there might be something that we can do to help fix that eligibility issue or there might be something we can do alternative kind of programs or something that might might help you get through this situation as well. This application is an online application. There are no paper applications with the Back to Business grant. So if you are in need of technical assistance, that is something that we are trying to work out, um, potentially some computer and scanner options. So the phone number for the hotline is 662-510-4890. And we're open Monday through Friday, eight to five, just normal business hours. And I will be sharing this slideshow um, with Carol so that th this, these items can be distributed as needed. Um, so don't worry and feel like you have to jot every single thing down because this will be available later. And um, I know Kiad kind of went over the legislative history. Like we said, there's two buckets. First came out um, through the Department of Revenue that that $60 million for $2,000 checks to eligible businesses that were closed due to COVID. And then the one that we're mainly focusing on now is the grant program, the up to 25,000 grants. I have had some people who have asked questions on who was eligible. So they made that determination through something called a NACE code. That is an industry code that if someone did apply with the Secretary of State for like limited liability protection, they decided to be an LLC or a corporation, um, that you normally you have to select what industry you're in. So this is a full listing of those industries. Um, and just wanna point out 6244 on the, the right side of the screen, child daycare services is one of those. So some folks might be sitting here kind of wondering well, I think I qualify for this and I didn't get a check. <laughs> the checks already have been distributed. So um, if you do think you qualified and you think that a mistake may have been made in that situation, 
there is a email address that you can contact the Department of Revenue because the Department of Revenue is the one that administered this program. And um, one of the prerequisites was that you had to have a, a 2018 or 19 tax return. So that, that could potentially be one of the issues you're facing um, if for some reason you didn't get the grant, I mean, the, the $2,000 check. But you can email them at COVID19relief at dor.ms.gov. And they ask that you provide the business name, your account number, and the reason you believe that you met all the criteria for eligible payment. So we don't have, with the Small Business Development Center, any information as to what they see on their end at the Department of Revenue, but we do have this contact information and um, it's, it's something that you can utilize if you do need to reach out and get some clarification on why you didn't get a check. And so like um, Kiad talked about, MDA, which is the Mississippi Development Authority, is the administrator of the grant program and that's what our main focus is today. They actually opened the portal on June 10th, 2020. So we are getting close to, getting close to that three week mark, huh? And the design of the program, it is for businesses who suffered an interruption, some sort of disruption in their business operations due to COVID-19. And it is supposed to stimulate the growth and economic relief and recovery among Mississippi small businesses. And Kiad went over eligibility. I'm just going to kind of quickly go through them again. And um, if there are questions at the end specific to these items, I'm happy to go into and elaborate a little bit more. But it must be a for profit corporation, limited liability company, a partnership, or a sole proprietorship was domestic as of March 1st, 2020. And we're going to go into that definition a little further in good standing with the Mississippi Secretary of State, if that is applicable to your business. You suffered an interruption of business. There's a controlling interest owned by one or more Mississippi residents. They, that you filed taxes for your 2018 or 19, or if you started business after January 1st, 2020, you intend to file taxes. That you have customers or employees coming to your physical premises. You conduct business on a customer's premises or there's an owner who is an active participant in the day-to-day -day operations of the business. And um, like Kiad also said, we, uh, this is for small businesses. So it's for those businesses that have no more than 50 full-time equivalent employees. And full-time equivalent is an interesting uh, wording for employees. And we're gonna go over that definition a little bit more down the line as well. They just wanna make sure also that if there, if there are other, um, entities, other businesses that might be affiliated with shared ownership that um, the number of full-time equivalents doesn't go over 50 that way either. They also specify that you cannot be a lobbying organization and the business cannot be making their money through passive investment. So it can't be a company that just holds real estate. That would be a good example of passive income. That's somebody's not doing a daily active activity. So what do you need for the application? I like to go over this first, um, although I do think that the website is a very easy website to get through. And yes, you can save as you go through it. And I think that some of the, the traffic they've had is probably slowed down a little bit. But one thing I was seeing in the very beginning is that Sometimes people, uh, they took a while to go get what they needed. Maybe they didn't know as they started the application process what they were gonna need. And so it would time out on them and then they would have to wait and get back in it again. And so just to avoid that, that's why I like to start with what do we need for the application before we even start getting into how we do the application. So what do you need? Your business name as registered with the Mississippi Secretary of State if you did register with the Secretary of State. And your trade name or doing business as name. The type of business entity you are. So that would be, are you a limited liability company? Are you a corporation? Are you a sole proprietorship? Are you a partnership? There's a drop down menu when you get to it and you, you pick those items. Your data formation or creation, your business address, a taxpayer identification number or 
if this business is not incorporated or it hasn't registered with Secretary of State for legal liability purposes, and um, you're just a sole, you're in a sole proprietorship, meaning that you're probably filing a tax return that has a Schedule C, it links back to your Social Security number, so you would need your Social Security number if that's the situation you're in. The Mississippi Secretary of State business ID number, if you did do those filings for a corporation, LLC, limited partnership. A business phone number, primary contact, email address, your tax return for 18 and 19. Number of full-time equivalent employees as of March 1st, 2020. And then you need to be prepared to discuss in a, what I like to call a narrative form. So basically in written form, how you were disrupted because of COVID-19, what happened to your business due to COVID-19 that made you suffer a loss, a loss and made you eligible for help through this grant. You also have to give a list of ownership information, the owner's name, the title, how much they own of the business, um, taxpayer identification number for that owner and their address, and um, explain whether or not they're Mississippi residents and whether they participate in the day-to-day -day business. And there is a section, which Kiad kind of touched on already, um, that there's a set aside for minority-owned businesses. So there is a section if you would like to be prioritized and you qualify as the mi minority-owned business that you would certify that in the application. And we're gonna go over that in more detail. Responses to whether the applicant has applied for or received the following funds, because this is one thing we talked about is there's a potential reduction based on you receiving Paycheck Protection Program loan money, Economic Injury Disaster loan money, the Economic Injury Disaster Emergency Advance, any other federal program that you may have received some money from, like, like SBA Bridge Loan or some other, some other um, items. It's kind of a catch-all. And then insurance proceeds, which... I would love to know who got some because <laughs> I would like to talk to that agent myself for real. Um, a determination of how you want to actually get this uh, grant, how you want it calculated. Like Kiad explained, there's a couple ways to do that. It could be based on your employee count or it could be based on your um, eligible expenses. So the supporting documents that you would have to have ready when you go into this application, depending on um, how you're doing this, is your full-time equivalent calculation as of March 1st, 2020, and then supporting payroll documents. Um, one of the things that I wanted to point out now is that they ask you if you are doing this based on full-time equivalent employees, do not list your employees' social security numbers or addresses and turn it in like that. Um, I think they just want to make sure if anything ever happened where the site was compromised in any way that, that we haven't uploaded tons of data that someone's identity could be stolen. Um, so if you're going the eligible expenses route, you would be turning in utility bills and the proof of payment for those, lease agreement and proof of payment um, of rent. If you own it, own your business uh, space that you're in, that would be your mortgage statement and then your proof of payment there. Itemized receipts if you had to buy personal protective equipment or other items that would qualify as eligible expenses. Um, just kind of related to COVID-19 safety. Your tax returns for 2018 and 19 and a proof of good standing with Mississippi Secretary of State if that is applicable to your type of business. So once you have all those items gathered, you're gonna go to the website, which is https colon backslash backslash www.backtobusinessms.org backslash. Um, at that time, they're going to have you put in an email address. So you have to have an email address to, to go through this application process and you'll create an account and they're going to send you an access code. We have seen some people maybe run into issues where they didn't get an access code or um, maybe other technical issues with the actual website. Unfortunately, that is not something Small Business Development Center can troubleshoot. Um, we don't have access into the website to know exactly why there might be some sort of technology issue there. But I do have a phone number or two phone numbers actually here that you can call if you do run into a technology issue with the website. And those are 1-800-462-9980 or 601-228-1774. 
So once you have created your, uh, your, all of your access code and gotten in and, and now you're into the, the grant and you've got everything ready to go, it's going to look like this from the beginning. So I have just screenshotted and kind of made up a fake company and just so MDA knows I did not submit this and put something in line that uh, <laughs> that they're going to have to pull out later. So I did not go all as, as far as submitting, but I did go in and just kind of make sure I understood what everything looked like. So first thing you're putting in is your business name. You're doing business as or trade name. Um, you're going to select whether you're a sole proprietorship, whether you're an LLC, whether you're a corporation, whether you're a partnership, that whole drop down list we've talked about before your data formation and then your full time equivalent account. You might be wondering how that is calculated. And so we're going to talk about that right now. So there are a number of ways that this could be calculated and what was chosen by MDA in their setting rules is the 30 hour a week average employee count number. So they give a look back period of 26 weeks that you would go through to average um, your employees hours. If you have an employee who is on average working over 30 hours a week, and this, and when I say employee, I mean a W-2 employee, an employee who gets a W-2 at the, at the end of the year, not someone who gets a 1099. I'm talking about just those W-2 employees. So if they are working 30 or more hours a week, that means they are a full-time employee. So you could separate out everybody that averages more than 30 hours a week and they're considered full-time. Then if you have employees that do not work more than 30 hours a week, let's say you have three employees and they work 20 hours a week on average. So we would say 20 plus 20 plus 20 equals 60. We would divide it by 30 and that would mean that you have two full-time equivalents out of those three people. And then we would add it to the full-time equivalent number. And just a reminder, if this business is part of some other larger businesses, they want to make sure this stays going to small businesses, which are um, less than 50 full-time equivalent employees. So they don't allow if there's some brother sister companies with shared ownership, they don't allow them to, to apply individually. They're going to be lumped together and, and potentially be over 50. The next part is the tax identification number. Um, that you would be putting in or your social depending on whether you're, you know, an LLC or a corporation or whether you are a sole proprietorship. The Mississippi business identification number coming from the Secretary of State website. If you did, if you did do the certifications through the website for formation and did the business file taxes in 18 or 19. Um, or are they exempt from filing taxes under Mississippi Code Annotated Section 27729 or Section 271369? This is kind of a repeat, so I don't want to keep going over that slide again. Then you're going to explain um, whether you had an interruption um, in your business due to COVID, and you're going to put a start date and an end date. If, if you're still having an ongoing issue because of COVID, you can leave it blank. So one of the things that we did see when the rules came out that it, it, it did say interrupted and we thought that that would require voluntary uh, or an involuntary closure of the business. But um, it looks like the definition is a little bit expanded to impact or disruption, which is a little bit more broad as to what could have happened to your business to cause a problem. So you have to be prepared at this point in the describe the interruption to explain what happened. Um, did your business close because there was a, a municipal order or governor's order that, you know, your child care facility had to close? Well, we would put that in there and we would put, you know, how long it was closed and what kind of impact it had. So we we're going to put that um, in, in the, the bottom part of this slide right here. I'm going to skip just a little. Then you're going to put your business address. And remember, your business has to be domestic. So that means your business has to be a Mississippi business. And there are a few ways that that is determined depending on what your business um, 
is. So if you're a corporation, that means that you filed with the Secretary of State and you have articles in corporation um, in the state of Mississippi. If you're a limited liability company, that means that you were legally formed here in the state of Mississippi, very similar to a corporation, um, and that you have your certificate of formation with Mississippi Secretary of State as well. If you're a limited partnership, you would have also filed with Secretary of State. If you're a general partnership, that means you, if you have at least one domestic partner owning more than 50% of the business um, and that they reside in Mississippi and the business's principal place of business is in Mississippi. And then for a sole proprietorship, that means that the owner lives in Mississippi and the business's principal place of business and operations is in Mississippi. Just remember the goal and when you think about this, Mississippi received money from the federal government to help Mississippi. The legislature said we want to give some of this to small businesses to try to, we recognize that the small businesses in Mississippi need help. And we want to make sure based on what we're doing with this grant that the money is going to go to Mississippi businesses. So it makes sense, those domestic classifications. And then the next screen you're going to go over and just say who has a controlling interest. So who owns more than 50% and be prepared to list their name, title, the percent they own, whether they're active or not. Um, and kind of the, the, if they're a, a, another entity or they're a person. And there's some more information about what, how a controlling interest is defined. It's kind of my understanding that most folks um, in the audience today are very likely sole proprietorships or maybe they did do an LLC. And so I don't want to get into tons and tons of detail about the differences between all these entities because that could get very long and boring, but um, if it's an LLC, that means that 50% of the, the ownership interests are, um, are by a, I'm um, sorry, means a member who has an ownership of greater than 50% of the interest or has the power to direct operations of the business without the requirement of consent. So that means that person has a controlling interest. Um, for a sole proprietorship, means the sole owner has the, is gonna have the interest. And then we get to the minority business uh, designation. So there is actually a designation that you can get through the Mississippi Development Authority that says you're a minority owned business. And there are some, there are certain things that, that people would qualify for if they did that. Um, and it, it's a little bit of a process to do it. Recognizing that maybe not everybody has done that, there's also an opportunity to self-certify in this application if you do believe that you meet the requirements as a, of a minority owned business to get in the priority line. So they set aside 40 million for the first 60 days of the program for minority owned businesses. So if you wanna get in the priority line, you can self-certify here as well. So the, this, the section on the left is what the original screen looks like. It asks you if you're certified by MDA as a minority owned business. Um, let's say you didn't go through that certification process, you'd say no, but if you do believe that you are, you can click yes and it'll take you to the screen on the right. That is the designation request. And so basically you can self-certify and explain that yes, you do believe that you meet those requirements, that you are, are a um, minority owned business. Sorry, I need a little water. I'm talking too fast. <laughs> so what is a minority owned business? So at least 50% of whom are residents of the state of Mississippi and at least 60% are owned and controlled um, uh, by either one or more minorities or minority business enterprise prizes uh, or women as certified by the MDA. And if you go back to the other screen, you kind of see part of the certification process they're asking is, are you currently certified as any of the following? Um, SBA, 8A, Mississippi Department of Transportation, National Minority Supplier Diversity Council, Women Business Enterprise National Council. Then they give this definition that I just showed on the other screen and ask you to certify whether you think you meet that and you're gonna put your name, name of business, and you say that you are one of the following. So that would be Black, African American, Hispanic, Native American, Asian Pacific, Asian Indian, or other. And then you have to put whether you received these other awards. 
So if you did receive Paycheck Protection Loan, Economic Injury Disaster Loan, Economic Injury Disaster, um, the Emergency Advance, the Federal Program Reimbursement, uh, any of those sort of things that might have also kind of fallen under SBA or some other programs, um, you have to put that in there too. And if you've got any insurance proceeds, and also if you've got that $2,000 check from the Mississippi Department of Revenue, because that would serve, that would also potentially reduce the award. I'm going to skip over this one a little bit. So there are a couple ways to calculate the grant program, um, which, which way you want to do your calculation. And so you'll come to this screen. And so first of all, you could decide that you just want to stay at the base amount of 1500. If you were an eligible business, you could just say you want 1500 and stop there. Or you can make the decision to use the employee headcount number based on that calculation we talked about before, and you get 500 per employee. Or you can go through your eligible expenses, which would be anything you had to spend um, extra money on, on COVID, and we have a listing of things that qualify, and then mortgage interest, rent, utilities, and then they have a, an other qualification as well. And that's those, those eligible expenses are for two months. And this is just a little bit more explanation of exactly what I just did. So, so if you do go the itemized expense route, this is what you would be putting at this point. And remember, you do need uploadable documents, backup document, documentation to prove that you spent this money. This is basically, the grant is actually like a reimbursement. So this is why they're making you turn it in and they're going to reimburse you. So what are the eligible expenses due to public health measures? So that's cost to create social distancing measures, cost to clean or disinfect areas due to COVID, purchasing personal protective equipment for employees or customers. So if you had to purchase masks for yourself or gowns or any other items, contactless equipment, if you had to, uh, let's say you had to put up like plexiglass screens or other kind of shields to ensure that that um, we're, we're working within whatever the health department's guidelines and requirements of you are that are different than what you normally have to do for business. Um, equipment items or other expenses to screen employees or customers to ensure they're not COVID-19 positive. Does that mean that you have to make them fill out um, a form every day? You know, you're, you're paying for paper and ink. Does that mean that you are testing somebody with a, um, a thermometer? You bought a thermometer for that. Um, so equipment items designed to track your employees or customers who have tested positive, any necessary reopening expenses, um, and then expenses to facilitate teleworking. So if you had employees that you um, ended up accommodating and having them work from home and telework during this time, and maybe you had to buy them a cell phone or a hotspot or computer equipment or anything like that, that would also fall under those those eligible expenses too. And so if you're going the eligible expense route, you can do any of those re items related to the COVID safety and then mortgage interest for two months, rent for two months, payroll or utilities. Eligible expenses due to business interruption um, are only going to be for the two months. And the last thing that I've watched through the Mississippi uh, Development Authority, because I had some questions on how the reduction actually works. Um, They're preventing a double dip. So if you've got paycheck protection money, um, let's say they are not wanting to, you to use those same expenses you're turning in for that paycheck protection money as these. That's how the reductions would happen. So it did appear to me that if you could show, like if you're out four months and you do two months over with paycheck protection program for your utilities or whatever it would be, and you do a different two months that it might not create the same reduction. And that's something I'm kind of waiting on a little bit of an answer to. It seems, I know that they're attempting to stop people from double dipping. Um, so I might not have the very best set of answers on how exactly that reduction works. And I'm sorry on that if there are questions. So things that are not eligible, that's lost profits, damages that have or will, been, will be covered by insurance, or they're going to be reimbursed by the federal or governor or state program. 
um, reimbursement for donated items, workforce bonuses or hazard pay or overtime, severance pay, legal settlements, and anything else that's deemed ineligible um, through the U.S. Treasury Department. So last screen, so I will be finishing up. And I know this was a, a, a long, long presentation to go through each one, but I'm hoping it's clearing up some of the questions as we go through it is you've got to upload all your documents to prove um, what your expenses were and to prove that you're eligible for this grant. So they have a drop down list and this is your drop down list of those items. So confirmation if you're in good standing with Mississippi Secretary of State, that is if you are an LLC, if you're a corporation, if you're a limited partnership, you would be turning that in. Your tax documents for 2018 or 19, proof of payment of mortgage interest, proof of payment of rent, proof of payment of payroll, proof of payment of utilities, COVID-19 related expenses. Um, one thing that I wanna to touch on, so if you are a LLC, limited partnership, or a corporation, you have to be in good standing with the Secretary of State. This is something we could potentially help you with if for some reason you are not in good standing. A lot of times people just forget to file their annual report. So if that's the case, we might could help you get yourself back into good standing if you got administratively dissolved. Um, if there is a back tax issue, then that is gonna prohibit somebody from getting put back into good standing until they pay the taxes. Just a reminder, you can't be a lobbying organization, which I think probably most of this audience would not fall into that. And the income has to be active. There's another little caveat that is within the requirements and that is the business cannot be in bankruptcy. And if the business goes into bankruptcy while this application is pending, there's an obligation to notify the MDA and withdraw. And just a reminder about the premises, um, customers have to do business on the physical premises or you go to their physical premises to do business and you have an owner who's an active participant, sorry, not an, or you have an owner who's an active participant in the day-to-day -day operations of the business. And just some reminders as well, Kiat already talked about this, but 21 days um, was kind of set aside for, to prioritize people who did not get any of that extra special federal aid that we talked about and then at least 40 million is set aside for minority owned businesses within the first 60 days of the program. So if you want some help in doing the application, we are here to help. We are open for business. We are doing virtual appointments or telephone calls, but you can go to our website. It's HTTPS colon backslash backslash www.mssbdc.org backslash. And you can sign up to register for counseling. There's a, if you look at the right hand side of the screen, there's a little area you click to register for counseling. Or you can give a call to our hotline and we can help walk you through that process as well. And the phone number again is 662-510-4890, open 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday. So just normal business hours and business days. This is just to let you see, this is a, a, a lot of our our campuses around the state, this is where we have offices. So University of Mississippi, USM, Hines, Jackson State, Mississippi State, East Central, and the city of Jackson itself as well. And I have a little disclaimer, I always have to put to you this, we're SBA funded, so the Small Business Administration funded. So I'll stop share and if we have any questions, I'm ready to help on those hopefully. Um, Janet, can you or Kiad just say, when you say that um, the first 60 days are for women-owned businesses and minority businesses, what are the dates that you mean when you say the first 60 days? But the program opened on June 10th, so 60 days from June 10th. Okay. Now, um, applications for other businesses that are not minority-owned are allowed to, to go at this time. They have just set aside 40 million that is designated to make sure it goes to minority owned businesses first off the top. And if you are a woman owned or a minority owned child care center, but you don't have the designation as such, uh, can you still identify as that? Yes, you would self certify in the application and so you, you would say that you believe you are you'd click yes and it would take you to another screen where you can self-certify that 
Um, and uh, is one of the eligible costs that a child care center could request the grant for hiring additional staff because the recommendation is that their class sizes be smaller than the okay, based on the Department of Health requirements? I think um, it's uh, the Department of Health allows a bigger class size than the CDC recommends. Okay. And so many child care centers have used the CDC recommendation, but it's meant having to hire more staff. So would that be a cost they could apply for? So I would go ahead and put it. I, I do not know specifically. So NDA has kind of outsourced through a company that's going to go through these applications and, and, and check against different data. And, and then they're going to be the ones kind of helping get this, this grant put out. I would put what the CDC recommendations are and the fact that you had to hire and I would put that in my narrative as well. Okay, I ha I'm going to go to the questions now. Um, there is a question asking if you could please show your first slide. Let me see if I can get back to it. Let's see. I might, if, if we're going to have to go, if we want to go through different areas, I will just, I'm going to screen okay, share. Okay, we'll show that in a minute. And um, we'll just pull we'll that in different things as needed. How about that? Um, okay. I, um, so the, the, are we sure we want the first slide or are we wanting, is there something specific they're wanting to see? Uh, whoever asked that question, if you could clarify what you're asking to see, that would be helpful. But I think the question just says the first slide, so maybe it was the phone number. Um, the, we have a, <clears throat> a couple of questions about nonprofits. Uh, are nonprofits eligible? What's available for nonprofits? And will nonprofits get the $2,000? Okay, so nonprofits are not eligible businesses for this grant program. It is for profit businesses. Um, there are other programs through the federal government, through, through Small Business um, Administration, SBA, that are available, um, pay, Paycheck Protection and the Economic Injury Disaster Loans. They have made those available to nonprofits. And just recently, it has not been signed into law yet, but the House and Senate did pass basically a, I think they're calling it the P4. <laughs> They've extended the Paycheck Protection Program um, application to, I believe it's going to be August 8th. And that hasn't That's been signed into law yet. Okay, mm -hmm. it hasn't been signed into law yet, but that might be another um, opportunity if someone hasn't done that yet. It is back open. We have another question. I have submitted my application. What is the time frame for approval or to hear back, and how long is the process? So, <laughs> this is a good question, and I am sorry to say I do not have the answer. Um, they have a frequently asked question section of the website. And the last that I looked on MDA's website, they didn't have a full timeline. Um, you can check your status. You're supposed to be able just to sign right back into your account that you established. And you can call um, their hotline if you need a little bit more information. But unfortunately, I don't know how long there it's gonna be, but I can put the slide up that you would, where you would call um, and the website has frequently asked questions and they might be updating as they go. I think um, they're probably seeing you know, how overwhelming it is and how much time it takes to go through the process. Just kind of as a reminder, none of our governmental entities were equipped to, to administer these programs before. And so everybody has had to hire a lot of staff or outsource staff to, to do all these programs. So that might be why um, I haven't seen an estimate specifically yet. Is it a different application for minority and women-owned businesses? And if so, where do I go to apply? It is the same application, but you're just, when you get to the screen, and I'll pull it up, you're going to get to a screen that says minority business. And they ask you to say whether you are, you, you are like certified through MDA, or if you believe that you would meet the requirements to be a minority-owned business. And so even if you aren't certified, you're gonna, if you believe you are meeting the requirements as a minority of business, you're gonna say yes, and it's gonna take you to the screen on the right. 
and that lets you do your designation. If you did not close your daycare business, are you still eligible to apply? I would say yes. Um, if we talk, remember back when we talked about what the rules said um, was that you had to have, a, it was basically like a voluntary closure. But then when the application came out, they said interruption, impact, or disruption, which leads me to believe that you, you've got some, a little bit more leeway. So I would make sure I explain the narrative, what has happened that has you know, created a, a disruption to your business and a loss in your business that would make you eligible for this. If you received the payroll protection program, are you still able to receive this grant? You are, mm -hmm. um, but uh, Keon, you, you go for it. <laughs> no, I was, go I was going to say, yeah, yeah, you can still uh, receive uh, the grant. It'll just be the amount of money that you receive from the payment protection program will be deducted from your eligible grant amount, but no more than half of that. Okay. But go ahead, Jen, I just wanted to quickly no, add you're that. Right. So I, I honestly found the rules to be a little bit vague on that because they did say that they could reduce in full and then I watched a webinar that MDA did mm -hmm. with SBA and they said um, so it seems like there might be a way around if you are making sure you're turning in different expenses than what you're doing for paycheck protection versus this grant that might be a way around it um, but like I said I don't have that perfect answer. We do know the rules say they could reduce up to half and then they have another section that says they could reduce up to full. Yeah. And, and let me quickly add to Janet, they mm -hmm. will reduce it up to the full amount if you're using the grant funds and the payment protection mm -hmm. funds or federal assistance funds the for the same, same expenses. There you go. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Keon, I think you had better clarification for sure than what I had on it. I was trying to work through it. It's, it's a yeah, it's a little confusing. And Kiata, I see that you were um, raising a question. Is there assistance for businesses who may need to file their taxes in order to be eligible? Um, is that a question for the Small Business Development Center? Yeah, uh, anyone who can, who can answer yeah. that. It's, it's <laughs> question that came out, yeah. The Small Business Development Center cannot be a preparer of someone's taxes, but we certainly can talk through the process of what one would need to do to, to prepare their tax return and, and if necessary, try to help refer them for help um, with that process. Um, here's a question. If you own half of your business and your husband owns half of your business, are you a woman-owned business? So let's go back to the definition. Now I have to remember which way to go, sorry. Okay. So at least 50% of whom are residents of the United, oh, so, sorry, of the state of Mississippi and um, shall be ascribed to the term under Small Business Act, um, women in the term owned and controlled means a business in which one or more minorities or minority business enterprises certified by MDA own 60% of the interest. And Kiad, if you know this in any kind of different way, my reading of this is you need 60% of the, the, bit, the business to be owned by women or minority. Yeah, my reading is the same. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, here's another question. Can I get the $2,000 if I go ahead and do my 2019 taxes now? I haven't done my 2018 taxes or 2019. If I do one of them, can I still qualify? For the 2000 from the Department of Revenue? I yeah. would put in a, a question to the Department of Revenue. because I, I do not know for sure, but we do have the email address. Um, if you were if you were in business in 18 and 19, though, you know, that, that's one of the eligibility requirements. The only way that 19, I mean, you're, sorry, what was the question? Did they ask for 19 or did they say 18? So, say well, it again, Carol, I'm said, sorry, I just gone down a rabbit hole. <laughs> sorry. 
She said she hasn't done her 2018 or 2019 taxes, and she wants to know if she go ahead, she goes ahead and does her taxes, can she qualify now? I am not sure if um, Department of Revenue is going to send out more checks if you do this after the fact. Um, I do think that this could help get you in line for the the grant itself, but I would ask that question to the Department of Revenue. That's why I'm trying to get back to which slide I had for that. Okay. So I would ask that question to the COVID-19 relief at dor.ms.gov. And there might be something within frequently asked questions. That's just not one that's come up to me or stood out to me that I've, I've um, pulled before. We have one person who thinks after hearing this presentation uh, that she did some areas of her application wrong. Is there a way to go back and correct if you've submitted something that needs to be so corrected? I would call the hotline and ask about editing your, your profile, like your, your application. And that one I'll pull up too. <laughs> I think we're... And just want to quickly add mm -hmm. for the question about um, receiving direct payments. Mm -hmm. I don't think it would hurt to go ahead and file and then double back with the Department of Revenue. Yeah. Okay. Well, and also the happen. only way you, you're, the only way you could get a grant is if you file. That's right. Yeah. Right. So you should definitely do that. Um, sorry. I just want to quickly oh, touch yeah. back on that question. Yeah, no, thank you. And uh, here's another question. I already submitted my application. Do you have to submit your tax return for 2019 in order to be eligible? So I believe it's 18 or 19 you can submit. Okay. Um, I never received the $2,000. I've sent two emails since the process opened and no one has replied. Is there another way to contact them? So Department of Revenue does have a phone number. Um, I don't know for sure, honestly. Um, I, I know what they've established um, in the information they've given out and that's to do this email. Um, they, you know, Department of Revenue does have a phone number for their, you know, that, that Raymond office, I believe they have, if, if you do want to call it, I mean, just Google the number and, and ask um, for some help on COVID-19 payment information and see if they can get you in touch with somebody. But I don't have any other answers other than what I know they've provided to us, which is just the email. I'm sorry. This is another question about going back to change something. How can we change something after we've submitted the application? I put my tax ID number for the tax identifier and the business identification number. I need to change the business ID number. Yeah, so I would, I would call their, I would call MDA's hotline. I'm trying to figure out where I've got that in here. Sorry. I just um, I answered that question in the uh, in the chat. There's an email you can uh, you can. Uh, there's an address. There's an email address you could contact with the description okay. of your issue, and that should get you starting the right track. That email is b two b m s help at b the geek dot com. I'm writing this down myself. <laughs> Yeah, could you put, did you put that in the chat to everyone or did you just answer to that person? I thought I'd put it to everyone. I'll see if I can, can I copy this? Yeah, I'm going to copy it and put it in the um, general chat really quick. That would be super. Thank you so much for doing that. Okay, let's see here. Okay. And the other thing I want to remind everyone, there is a recording of this webinar. We're going to post it on our COVID-19 resources page of our website. So after this is over, anyone can go back and refer to the webinar again. Um, and uh, we're going to put the web addresses that have been referenced in this webinar also on our COVID-19 resource page. So um, people can look there 
after the webinar to go back and get information if you missed something or if you come up with a question as you're trying to make your way through this application. Great. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much, Kia. Yeah, that came up for everyone there. Um, I don't see any other questions. If any participants have another question, um, we have a couple more minutes uh, before we have to go. Um, but in the absence of questions, uh, Janet and Kiad, I would like to let you have a chance to make any final comments if you would like to. Sure. Um, well, I just wanted to say thank you so much for having me. And just as a reminder, um, even if you are not looking for help with the grant program and you just need small business help in general, whatever that technical assistance might be with budgeting or, um, you know, growing your business, any of those items, we are still open for business and um, we're just doing virtual appointments, but we're ready and, and want to help. So please give us a call or register for counseling. And Janet, just to uh, clarify, you did say that you your offices do offer assistance for anyone who needs help with this application? Yes. Okay. Yes. So I just want to underscore that for everyone. Yes. Too. You could follow up if you need help uh, making your way through this application. Thank you so much. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I also want to say thank you for having me and giving everyone the opportunity to learn more about the Mississippi Small Business Relief Program. Uh, concerning pardon words, I just want to remind people, as Janet mentioned earlier, that the PPP uh, has been, the Payment Protection Program has been extended to August 8th, and Hope is a PPP lender. Uh, to date, we have uh, processed over 2,000 loans, with the max wow. total loan amount being uh, over $74 million. Our median loan amount has been just over $10,000, and the majority of our loans, 95%, have been under $100,000. And so we cater to small businesses, many of which are sole proprietors and businesses of color. And so please take advantage of the, the federal relief, the payment protection program, and the state relief that we have with the small business relief program here in the state. So again, thank you. Please apply. Um, we want to. All, we want to see as many businesses survive in the pandemic as possible. I want to underscore that. And thank you so much, Kiad. And Hope has been such a resource for so many child care centers in Mississippi. Um, I want to thank both of you. And uh, just to let you know, we had 107 participants from across the state uh, listening to your information. And we're grateful to you for participating. Let me just check one quick thing. It looks like we did have, uh, we had a question about what specific things the money should be spent on. Um, and I know that you went through that, uh, Janet, if you wanna just uh, so this is a that briefly. <laughs> this is actually considered a reimbursement. So depending on how you want your grant calculated, whether that's full-time equivalent employees, or those that list of eligible expenses, but they are not coming back and tracking how you you spent that. Um, so you say what your losses are, and then they get. So you just have to prove that you did spend it, and then you're reimbursed for it. Hope that makes sense. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. I'm so grateful to all of you who participated and to our panelists. I want to thank you very much. I hope everyone has a wonderful, safe July 4th weekend. Um, social distancing, wear masks, uh, protect yourself and your family in this time of public health challenge. Goodbye, everyone.